Hi, I'm Mark Brumley. Welcome to this Ignatius Press interview. Today we have Dr. Larry Chapp with us and with us as well as Carl Olson, editor of Catholic World Report. Welcome, everyone. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Dr. Larry Chapp is a retired professor of theology, but don't hold that against him. He <laughs> taught for 20 years at uh, DeSales University in Pennsylvania. He and his wife uh, own and manage a Dorothy Day Catholic Worker Forum in Pennsylvania. He is a prolific author. In fact, he is the author behind Gaudium at Spes 22, not the Vatican II document, paragraph, but the website, gaudimitspez22.com, and he is one of the promulgators of a manifesto of the new traditionalism released on December 22nd, 2021. Yes. Larry, welcome and tell us about what you're up to with this new manifesto, this manifesto of the new traditionalism. Uh, first, thanks for inviting me. It's, it's great to have an opportunity to really push this manifesto because we think it's important. The first thing I want to say is that there are three main signatories to this thing, uh, Sean Domenichik, myself, and Mark Barnes, uh, who is editor at New Polity. And I want to be very clear, so as to avoid any accusations of <laughs> intellectual impropriety, that Sean Domenichik was the key author of this document. He wrote 95% of it. My input was largely theological, editorial. I added a few paragraphs, so I wanted to get that out right from the get-go and give Sean proper credit, uh, because I think he really did a fantastic job with this thing. Anyway, what the new uh, the new traditionalism is essentially, it's, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a manifesto, meaning that we hope that it's a, a sort of statement that people will sign on to, and that it can make the rounds go viral and become a kind of reference point, a rallying cry uh, for reform and renewal within the Church. And we... We, we chose the title, Sean chose it, and, I, and we bandied around different titles, and then we finally landed on this one, uh, because we think that, obviously, every Catholic, in some sense, should be a traditionalist, because to be a Catholic means that you have to abide by uh, the revelatory nature of tradition as well as Scripture. So the question is, is it a bit redundant to say a new traditionalism, or is it not a contradiction to say a new traditionalism? Not really, because as, as you your viewers know there's currently a you know a movement within the church that many people call the the radical traditionalists or just the traditionalists or the traditional latin mass goers uh, but lately they've sort of laid claim to this title of traditionalist and i think it's 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 fine i i have no uh, major argument with the traditionalists i have some quibbles some criticisms to make nevertheless uh i think they've abrogated to themselves rather unfairly this title as, as sort of, they're the defenders of the tradition. And, and as a resource mont theologian myself, uh, you know, that's a form of traditionalism. Uh, Pope Francis espouses a form of traditionalism. So the question naturally arises, uh, what kind of traditionalism are Catholics going to subscribe to here? Uh, we, yeah, we all have to pay attention to, tra to tradition, but the word traditionalism has come to mean something in many ways rather pejorative in many circles. Uh, and so we, we wanted to retrieve the word traditionalism and, and to firmly place it within the thought world of resource mont theology, the Catholic Worker Movement, and the Second Vatican Council. Oh my goodness, there's a lot there. I'm going to uh, turn things over, you know, the laser level of intensity and questioning to Carl Olson, <laughs> Catholic World Report. Because oh, I, I can't wait. I, I could, as you were, you were as you were speaking, I could just, I could see his laser attention focusing on different facets of, of your remarks. So, Carl, what do you think about that? No, I think it's it's great. I, I think this is a really fantastic document, a really fascinating document, uh, and one that should challenge people to think about a lot of different interrelated topics um, in a way that I think we've there's basically the ruts have become really deep, as you know, Larry. Yes. Uh, the, the, the conversations <clears throat> have become redundant. I, I know you're on social, all three of us are on social media in different ways. We see it. I think this manifesto has the potential of helping people break out of the ruts, having a better conversation, taking it out of the realm of just polemics, 
and trying to really engage with substantial issues, whether or not people you know disagree with you on certain points or not. I think it's it's an important conversation. Um, I want to start with a, a question about, and it's kind of a continuation of what you just said already. Very early on in the document, uh, there's a statement: "We reject the whitewashed tombs of this dead traditionalism." So, what is this dead traditionalism? We touched on it a little bit, but to amplify that some more, what is the dead traditionalism, and are there different forms of that? And um, and rejecting it, where do you go from there? That's kind of a big <clears throat> question, but. Yeah, I mean, obviously, with a manifesto that is necessarily, uh, you know, brief, it has to remain short, it can't be a book, uh, there there are going to be certain sort of broad and sweeping statements, and, that, and that's one of them. And what we mean, that's tied into, too, with a sort of accusation towards the beginning of a kind of pharisaical mentality uh, that has crept into certain traditionalist circles. And what we mean by the, the whitewashed tombs of a dead traditionalism is, is that tradition is something that's supposed to be living. It grows. It, it evolves. And that, I don't mean to sound like a raving li liberal, you know, that everything can evolve into something else. Uh, there has to be continuity, which is what we're going to emphasize. But a dead traditionalism is a traditionalism, and, and it's out there. There's, there's a strong component of this that wants to freeze frame the tradition as this ossified, reified thing, uh, a sort of Denzinger approach, if your viewers know what that means, a sort of compendium of doctrines and dogmas and papal statements and papal bulls all gathered together. And, and it's a kind of Catholic fundamentalism where, where you, you sort of reject everything in the modern church, including resource mont theology, which would include the theology of Pope Benedict. You want to freeze frame it in the sort of neo-scholastic framework uh, of, the, of the 19th and early and mid 20th century. You want to freeze frame it in, in terms of conciliar and papal statements uh, before the modern ones, and then to use those as a kind of bludgeon against everything in the modern church. Uh, and, and this is a dead traditionalism because it's, it's detached from the, the fact that it is Christ who is, who is the heart and soul of all church tradition, and it is Christ in his Holy Spirit that the church must live and breathe and pray and think, and as the church encounters ever new situations in the world, uh, it's, it's, going to, it's going to tease out of the tradition new insights um, and and, and, and sort of resurrect ideas in the tradition that had been eclipsed at, at the expense of others. But a dead traditionalism uh, doesn't want to hear about that. It simply wants to focus in on, on a few very sort of dogmatic statements that it thinks it alone knows how to properly interpret with its hermeneutic. Yeah, one thing, and then one thing I think will surprise some people um, here is that you know, you just talked about neoscholasticism and so forth, but you actually have a, a, a section, a major section in the manifesto talking about how the, the work and thought of St. Thomas Aquinas is essential yes. to this. And I think I, this is one thing, I think this is for me was the, the, the best, not the, the resonated the most with me, I'll put it that way, because it, it brought me back to uh, some things that Tracy Rowland has written about, yeah, uh, not original with her, but she's really amplified it. Um, where she shows, I think, very uh, persuasively that on one hand, after the council, you had uh, the the streams of Thomism, Neo Thomism, and the uh, Resourcement movement, Communio movement, that could work together. On the other hand, you had the Concilium and the liberation theology movements that have kind of gone together. And the two obviously have butted heads, and that's kind of the divide that we see in the church, broadly speaking. Yes. Um, so how does, how does the thought and work of St. Thomas Aquinas, who's obviously scholastic, how does that undergird or support or uh, you know, amplify? Why is he so important to well, what you're, the new traditionalism you're talking about? Well, Aquinas in general is important for obvious reasons. He's probably, you know, the premier theologian of, of, of the Western 
theological tradition, and many Catholic doctrines and dogmas rely heavily on his, his categories of thought, so he's indispensable. And the, the thing, though, is this, and you mentioned Tracy Rowland. In her book, Catholic Theology, and I love Tracy, she won the Ratzinger Prize, good for her, she, she deserved it. Uh, in her book, Catholic Theology, she outlines no, no fewer... I believe, in 17 different forms of Thomism that arose in the 20th century. And the problem with neo-scholasticism, and, and part of this dead traditionalism, is that it abrogated to itself the, the sole the, the soul, you know, uh, authority to properly interpret St. Thomas Aquinas. The fact is, resource Mont theology is a form of Thomism. It, you know, and, and, for example, Hans Urs von Balthasar, the man I wrote my doctoral dissertation on, qu quoted Thomas Aquinas more than any other other author in his massive trilogy. Uh, Henry de Lubac, perhaps one of the leading fathers of the Ressourcement movement, spent the entirety of his career trying to retrieve Aquinas's more nuanced, patristic understanding of the relationship between nature and grace, uh, and, and was very uncomfortable with the neo-scholastic rendition of, of the same. And, and, and those were the debates that happened between the neo-scholastics and the Ressourcement guys leading up to the council, and it seems to us, the authors of the manifesto, and to many others, of course, that the council, in a sense, came down on the side of the Ressourcement interpretation of Aquinas. Not entirely, uh, not entirely, but it seems as if the Ressourcement school won the day at the council. But then you mentioned Concilium. They won the day after the council. They won the media war. They, they had already occupied vast areas of the academy uh, that, we, that I think a lot of people weren't aware of. And so, as I said in one of my blogs, you know, the neo-scholastics, I use a war analogy, the neo-scholastics and the resource mont were, were going at it hammer and tong on the field of battle. And all the while, the, the, the sort of progressive concilium guys were sitting on the, on the wayside. And when the battle was over, they moved in. And the resource mont and, and neo-scholastics suddenly found themselves on the out. Uh, when it came to post-conciliar interpretation of things. Uh, we got outflanked. We got outmaneuvered. We got outstrategized. Uh, and then, with the, with the sort of rad trads, if you want to call them that today, they blame Ressourcement for a lot of this and lump them in with the yeah. progressives uh, on the grounds that since you guys destroyed neo-scholasticism, you're responsible for the fact that the progressives then swept into the vacuum. And, you know, uh, I think even Ratzinger acknowledges that there might be some tiny little kernel of truth to the fact that in the heat of battle, uh, perhaps the Ressourcement guys did not uh, pay enough attention to how they were getting outflanked in other ways. Interesting. Well, um, of course, you're using these terms, resource mont and concilium and uh, neo-scholastics. Many of our viewers, listeners, Won't know. will know these terms and they will properly categorize things. But a lot of people will not. Can you kind of give sort of the sure. average, you know, faithful Catholic, a thumbnail sketch of what these categories are, and who are some names that we would identify with these categories? Well, among the progressives, let's start with them. The progressives uh, tended to be modernists in, in, the, in the sort of strict sense of that word, which was that they wanted to reconfigure the entirety of dogma and dogma and doctrines along the lines of the modern world, and, and did so using the notion of historicity and historical conditioning, uh, that nothing in the tradition is set in stone because everything has a historical paradigm and a historical context, and human subjectivity always plays a role in how things are interpreted and received. And so the church has to be constantly, in a sense, updating itself in ever new ways as the flow of history moves on, developing new paradigms, not in necessarily even in continuity with the old paradigms, smashing the old paradigms, and creating, in a sense, new doctrines, new ideas that are openly contradictory to what came before, but all under the banner of a sort of flowing of human consciousness. 
the uh, neo scholastics the neo uh, and of course the neo scholastics were very critical of the progressives for for being subjectivists and historicists and relativists and they weren't completely wrong about that the neo scholastics wanted to preserve the tradition that arose around thomas aquinas after thomas aquinas what we called the the tradition of the commentators of aquinas uh, and many of the theologians that came after him as his interpreters like Cajetan and uh, and uh, Bellerman and uh, Suarez and people like that, and of course each one of these commentators has their own version of uh, of Thomas, and it is, but it is the neo scholastic claim that the commentators and the commentatorial tradition represent, in a sense, part of the Catholic tradition, and that they have to be paid attention to. And the problem, though, is that uh, in many ways the commentators get Aquinas wrong in my view. And this then was the point of the Resource Mont thinkers. The Resource Mont thinkers, in a nutshell, Resource Mont is a French word that means back to the sources. They loved Aquinas. They were Thomists of a kind, but they read Thomas through the lens of the church fathers and believed that the church needed to retrieve much, much more of the patristic tradition of the fathers and to read Aquinas in their light, also to retrieve scripture and to use the insights of modern scripture scholarship, the, the, the better forms of modern scripture scholarship, not the, uh, not the denigrating, for the forms that denigrate scripture, uh, and to use those insights to, to enhance our, our theological understanding even of Aquinas, but especially to read Aquinas through the lens of the fathers. This is critical and this is key. One of the things that I think the neo-scholastics ignore is, is the extent to which Aquinas quotes over and over again many church fathers, um, and, and also people like Dionysius, and uh, of course St. Augustine is ever-present in, in Aquinas. Uh, so, you know, this is the resource project in general, to, to in a sense upgrade Thomistic thinking through recourse to scripture and the church fathers and the neo and and a lot of that updating that involved a change in our understanding of the relationship between nature and grace that might seem like a very arcane debate to most average catholics sitting in the pew there's god's grace and there's human nature god's grace helps our nature what more do you need to know uh, but in a sense, what the neo-scholastics had done was to, let's, let's put it, this is what Bishop Robert Barron's phrase is, and I love it. He says that they had turned God's transcendence into a competitive transcendence. Mm. In, in other words, that if I'm doing something, God isn't. And if God's doing something in me, then I'm not. In other words, the, my will, God's will, my nature, God's nature, are in a certain sense, so very different from one another that they're kind of in a competition with one another. Whereas the patristic notion, the patristic notion is that human beings are made for God. The human soul fits into the divine heart like a hand into a glove. We, in him we move and have our being, and therefore our, even our natural end as creatures of God is to find beatific vision, to find fulfillment in God. And, and therefore, uh, God's grace is not in any way, shape, or form competitive with our nature. My will is most mine when it is most God's. And, 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 and I'm more human, not less, the more I am close to God. So you've, so you've talked about neo-scholasticism, you've talked about the what you described as the progressivist perspective, and then the resourcement theologians. How does communio fit into that? Because we've used that word <clears throat> communio earlier. Well, communio essentially, <coughs> excuse me, is a term that refers to the journal Communio International Catholic Review that arose uh, in, in the, uh, the idea of it in the late 60s and really came into its own in the early 70s. And it was started by De Lubach, uh, von Balthasar, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, and a few others, but those were the, the leading lights. And they, they, they started it precisely as a sort of counterpoint to the Concilium Journal that was all progressives. You went into any Catholic university library anywhere, and it had volumes and volumes of concilium, with, with, and it, it, was, it was winning the day. And so communio was started uh, in order to emphasize that Vatican II was not about turning the church into some sort of historicist, um, ever-moving Heraclitus on steroids, uh, <laughs> that, that the church is a communion. It's a nested hierarchy of related charisms, and 
Comunio was started out of the Resource Mont school and wanted to retrieve Thomas and the entirety of the tradition through the broader lens of Scripture and the Church Fathers um, and uh, even various forms of modern philosophy. And this is another very important point that I left out. The neo-scholastics were very suspicious of modern philosophy, and to a certain extent, well, they should have been. But they they were utterly rejecting of the, as if there's nothing there to learn. So the Comunio school and the Resource Mont school in general, out of which Comunio flows, wanted to engage modern philosophy and to imbibe those aspects of modern philosophy that were generally in, insightful. For example, uh, Carol Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II, uh, uh, liberally imported categories from Husserl and other philosophers that, that in the school known as phenomenology, and uh, was a, there was a version of Thomism in Poland called Lublin Thomism uh, that had these sort of personalist phenomenological insights, and so this distinguishes com- Comunio, um, I think, a little more from just the resource mont in the sense that Comunio really wanted to uh, sort of run with that, especially with the insights of John Paul. Very good. So, um, so we have these different camps, and there are there. You you mentioned um, in connection with the progressive camp or the concilium camp, you use this term historicism. Earlier, when you're describing them, you were, you referred to a kind of a modernist understanding of history uh, that t- takes Catholic beliefs and and practices and, and radically um, uh, it relativizes situated, them relativizes yeah, it, them in terms yeah. of history but one of the criticisms that some of the uh, neo-scholastic types have of the ressourcement and the communio theology is that it does the same thing how would you respond to that well i would say that that there there is a world of difference between uh, taking historical context into proper consideration as well as taking into consideration insights from the modern world concerning human subjectivity and therefore how we receive the faith and receive doctrines there's there's a world of difference between that uh, and the idea that everything becomes relative because of that. Uh, Communio resource month thinkers simply want to utilize uh, the historical context of ideas in order to deepen our understanding of those ideas, and in many ways to double down on those ideas, to show how, in fact, revolutionary the ideas were in their original context. In other words, it, it doesn't Let's take a, you know, Aquinas again. It doesn't aid our understanding of Aquinas to sort of dehistoricize him, turn him into an essentialized abstraction, a system, ossified. It is much better to place Aquinas in his times, to see him in conversation with Jews and Muslims, to see him in conversation with, with uh, the, the East, to see him in conversation with, with Aristotle and so on, and, and the Church Fathers. And when you do that, you don't relativize him. You actually deepen your understanding understanding of him. And that's why resource month thinkers wanted to go back to history, as did people like Cardinal Newman. All right. And so the charge from this is part and parcel of how uncareful, how unnuanced many neo-scholastic and modern traditionalist critiques of resource month are, where it's like, well, it's, you use history. And, and so therefore, you're just like the modernists. It's very uncareful and it's very unfair. And it only it only shows to what extent neo-scholasticism was an ossified and essentialized uh, stone uh, that just refused to budge and and was overly deductive in its form of reasoning. We've gotten a lot of uh, contextual background <laughs> for this new uh, traditionalism document. You've done a great job of giving us an overview. So when people uh, hear in the conversation references to these different terms or when they read the document themselves, they're going to have a, have a thorough uh, context for understanding it. Yeah. Now, many of the people who identify as traditionalists are cool, if not hostile, to many of the facets of Vatican II. So how is your traditionalism different? Well, our traditionalism utterly and completely accepts uh, the Second Vatican Council full stop without qualification. That doesn't mean that there might not be a few mild criticisms 
of the council here and there, mainly in some ways that it is now kind of dated with some of its pastoral notions. Uh, but datedness is not a sin. It just means it was of a certain time. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, uh, it goes to show that traditionalists, in a sense, have been red-pilled by the modern church. I like that phrase. It, it's essentially a bunch of conservative Catholics who are formerly sort of JP2 Catholics who have gotten red-pilled by maybe Pope Francis or the modern church, and now all of a sudden say, oh, to heck with it, we're done with it, and we, we just want to go back to what was before the council when everything was hunky-dory, which, of course, it wasn't. So there's a romanticization and idealization of the past that we also reject. But specifically, as we lay out in the manifesto, things like uh, the, the conciliar acceptance of religious freedom, the conciliar notion that the liturgy did need a reform, that doesn't mean the Novus Ordo is necessarily perfect, uh, or even an expression of what the Council Fathers really wanted. We could have a whole conversation about that, because the manifesto talks about liturgy. Uh, but the, the fact is, things like interreligious dialogue, most traditionalists I know today reject interreligious dialogue as a slippery slope into religious relativism. I mean, podcast after podcast, YouTube after YouTube, you see them going on and on and on about how Vatican II opened the door to religious indifferentism and relativism because it embraced religious freedom, it embraced interreligious dialogue. If I'm having dialogue with a Hindu, I need to preach Jesus Christ and conversion to them. I don't need to sit down and exchange ideas and theology. And so there's a deep suspicion there. Likewise with ecumenism, they view it, uh, the, the traditionalists view it as simply uh, letting kind of Protestantism in through the back door in order to Protestantize the church. Nothing could be further from the truth. We have a mandate from Christ that all may be one, as, 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 as Christ and his Father are one. It is a mandate of the Holy Spirit that we seek to the extent that we are possible, that it is possible, uh, cooperation with our separated Christian brothers and sisters, and to, in a sense, better understand our elder brothers in the faith, our Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, towards whom we owe some apologies for certain historical things as well. But uh, And so the manifesto that we wrote wants to affirm, all right, both Catholic identity, Catholic orthodoxy, we are thoroughly orthodox Catholics. Some would call us, you know, conservative Catholics. And, and I'm sure most liberals would think we're raving reactionaries, uh, <laughs> uh, as was Dorothy Day, who I want to get to in a second. You know, they would think that of her. Um, and so that's, that's the difference. You know, we accept liturgical renewal. We accept religious freedom. We accept ecumenism. We accept interreligious dialogue. We accept the increased role of the laity in the church and the universal call to holiness as absolutely critical. Uh, Lumen Gentium V is absolutely critical to understanding the entire council and its universal call to holiness. Phrases like the people of God, a pilgrim church and so on are, have become pejorative little b Molotov cocktails that the trads <laughs> like to throw at the council, people of God. That's a sort of laicization of everything. So, yeah, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but you get the point. All right, very good. Carl, you looked like you wanted to step in to the conversation here. Well, there's a section here in the uh, in part two where he, talk, where he talks about Thomism. Um, and you'd mentioned uh, patristics and the resource movement and so forth. And so it, it touches on that a little bit um, where it says, we affirm that a truly Catholic theology will embrace the both and approach of the universal church rooted in the philosophical principle of analogy and the Christology of Chalcedon. Uh, and then later on, it, you talk about um, all theology in order to be really uh, Catholic must be Christologically oriented in order to avoid all of the faults oppositional binaries that are the mark of every heresy, which through an exaggerated elevation of one truth at the expense of others, so often distort the heuristic fulfillment of all things in Christ. Uh, to me, I think that kind of sums up some of what you've you've been saying, and I think well, that, that's a reason for that because that's those are the two paragraphs that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I guess I, I recognize your voice in there. Um, I to me that this both and approach is essential, and I think that some. Maybe many traditionalists, so just use that term, uh, the kind of more radical traditionalists, see a both and approach, whether they admit it or not, as being a form of capitulation or relativism, or et cetera. Whereas, in fact, it's exactly what Chesterton talks about in Orthodoxy about the paradoxes of Christianity. 
uh, for me, it's one of the yes, things yes. that attracted me to the Catholic faith. Um, and that's why this resonates with me. That's why resource my theology resonated with me so much when I discovered it. And I started reading De Lubach, yeah. um, Ratzinger's introduction to Christianity, which I understood about approximately 4% of, um, <laughs> You know, I've, you I've got all the that, verbs, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. My joke with the introduction of Christianity, um, you know, considered to be Joseph Ratzinger is one of his masterpieces, if not the masterpiece. I think it is. Uh, is that is that it's easy to understand if you're completely uh, competent in continental theology <laughs> or you know, philosophy, right? Because it that book, to the point you're making earlier, that book is an engagement, a robust engagement with modern philosophy. And yet today, Benedict is seen by, by way too many, far too many Catholics, too, as some kind of reactionary, conservative, traditionalist yeah. pope. These you know, negative terms, when in fact he, in many ways, I think is one of the most eloquent uh, you know, articulators of an engagement sure. with sure. modernity. Sure. Shortly but, before becoming pope, he, yeah. he had a dialogue with Habermas, you know, yeah. so... So I, it, it yeah. is, fr you know, it's frustrating. Uh, I think that's the term that comes up again for me is, is frustration. But, you and I have talked about yeah. these things. It's yeah. Part of the problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that um, the Catholic Academy is still dominated by theological progressives. And because our broader culture is hostile to conservative traditional Catholicism, uh, they, they easily lean on the progressive wing of the church to help them define what's going on in the church. Sadly, that, that sociological reality allowed Pope Benedict, Joseph Ratzinger, to be labeled the panzer cardinal, this arch-reactionary, this uber-traditionalist, which is so unfair, so grossly unfair, uh, simply because he, he signed on to Humanae Vitae, he opposed women's ordination, and so all the sort of hobby horses of the left. Okay, and, and because he opposed those things uh, and had certain caveats about liberation theology, and well, he should have, uh, he got the, the, this very unfair reputation of being a sort of restorationist arch-reactionary, and, and it's not true. That book, Introduction to Christianity, changed my life, along with Balthazar's Love Alone. And I read them both when I was in my early 20s as an undergraduate. And like you, I barely understood most of it. But I knew there was something in there. And, and what was in there, because I was a young seminarian, and I was being exposed. I was in a very conservative minor seminary, and I was being exposed to all the neo-scholastic stuff. And I was so frustrated because on my own i you know i was a little library rat nerd a little skin, skinny little twerp you know probably really annoying to be around uh, uh, uh you know and and so i freely admit that uh, and so i go to my spiritual director and i'm laying all this out so he throws love alone at me he was a german jew convert yeah read this it will make you less stupid and <clears throat> And I did, and, and then all of a sudden, then he gives me Ratzinger and Guardini and all these guys, and a whole world opened, and what opened up was that Catholic both and. What opened up was the engagement with the modern world, but from a decidedly Catholic grounding and starting point, I realized it is possible, it is possible to talk to the modern world and to learn from the modern world, to grow with the modern world, while at the same time retaining uh, your Catholicism, and not only just retaining it, but deepening your Catholicism. All right, so like Balthazar, when he engages modern German idealistic philosophy, he just doesn't come in scorched earth and say, Hegel's wrong, Fichte's wrong, Schelling's wrong, all these guys are wrong, here's the Catholic truth, now be done with it. No, he worms his way in there from within, and he sort of rots it out like a termite and, and says, no, 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 here's okay, here's the edifice, what Hegel got right, but man, oh man, oh man, he needs this, he needs this Thomistic and patristic sort of foundation in there. And that's what Ratzinger did too, an introduction to Christianity. And this is what we mean by the both end, and it goes back to the nature and grace thing as well, okay, that God's God's agency, God's transcendence is not competitive with ours. That nature and grace go together like, like you know, uh, a hand in a glove. And, and, that we there, and that's why I mentioned Chalcedonian Christology. All of it is ultimately rooted in the Chalcedonian distinction between the divine and human natures in Christ, which remain distinct from one another, retain their identity, but also are one, are united. And that shows us that's the relationship of faith and reason, church and world as well. We are not the world. And faith is not reason, but they are to come together 
in many, many important ways to forge and for the kingdom of God is in a sense seated here in this world. The kingdom of God is the transformation of this world. It's not the annihilation of this world to be replaced by a different world. It's the transformation of this one. Anyway, I think you get the idea. Um, you mentioned Ratzinger engaging and dialoguing with uh, contemporary philosophy and their other resource mon and communio theologians that did that and do that. Uh, but, you know, as, as you were referring to that, I was thinking, well, that, that, that's really what St. Thomas did. Obviously, Aristotle was ancient, but he was also somewhat new yeah. in uh, the 13th yeah. century. And so here we have St. Thomas, who, you know, traditionalists see as the paragon of theological engagement. And what is he doing? He's engaging with what was then a rev revival of an ancient thought, it was current thought, uh, the philosophy of Aristotle. And he used that, and that very much permeated his whole theological synthesis. Now, of course, not all philosophical systems are equal, and so someone's going to say, well, there was more in Aristotle that fit uh, than in some of the uh, more contemporary philosophies and so on. But nonetheless, that process of engagement and, and uh, sifting through and finding what helps articulate the faith better and helps the human understanding of the faith better uh, was something that St. Thomas engaged in. Yeah, and that's that's the, one of the central points of our of our manifesto when we talk about a dead traditionalism. You go back to Aquinas. Aquinas did not believe the tradition was dead, and you know when Aquinas was first adopting Aristotle, of course, he got into a lot of hot water. He got into a lot of trouble. There were people like at the University of Paris who wanted to wanted to kill him. All right, and and he he just stuck to his guns because he understood that there was something of deep benefit intellectually for for the Christian faith. I mean, Aristotle was distrusted because he was thought to be a sort of worldly Greek philosopher, uh, whereas Plato was more otherworldly, and so the fathers and everybody preferred Plato. Uh, and what, what Aquinas does, and it's sheer genius, and my friend Matt Levering, a theologian, great guy, points this out, is, is that Aquinas doesn't just import Aristotle and then shove Christian doctrine into Aristotle. Uh, Aquinas actually reads Aristotle through the lens of Plato. There, there's a decidedly Platonic interpretation of Aristotle that Aquinas gives and makes it therefore more amenable as well to, to the Christian tradition as, as Aquinas appropriates the Father. So my point in this ramble is that look what Aquinas was doing. So innovative, so alive, and got him in trouble, okay? And, and, and was, in a sense, amalgamating worldly insights from non-Christian sources into Christian theology in order to properly understand even Christian theology better. Uh, there's nothing in the world that's good that can't be appropriated for the gospel. And this is my problem with modern traditionalists. Uh, you know, in, in some ways, I wish that most of these currently popular traditionalists, who, what I call fiddleback fuss budgets on the internet, uh, the, 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 they, they, they talk and talk and talk a lot about church dogmas. I wish that more of them actually would read Aquinas. I don't care how wooden their reading of Aquinas would be. Read him. But I doubt that most of them even do. Uh, so <laughs> there is, there is a, there's an even worse kind of ossification taking place here in the modern traditionalist movement, which is why I refer to it in some ways as a Catholic fundamentalism, uh, where the, the, they want to emphasize more the anathemas of Trent than the said contras of the, of the Summa. Uh, and, and um, you know, anyway. Interesting way of putting it. So basically, in this manifesto, there are four key points. There is the church is not a defensive castle, but a missionary people. United in love, that's the first point. Second, the perennial philosophy of St. Thomas is the foundation of new theology and, re and resource mont. Third, uh, natural law and preferential option for the poor unite in Catholic social teaching. And then the fourth, um, you talk about the necessary liturgical renewal, uh, which began, was betrayed, and, uh, and left unaccomplished. There's a lot there. We, we are well into this conversation. I know. We've only scratched the surface of it, but you've kind of given us a little bit of a feel for what you mean by the church isn't a defensive castle and a church is a missionary people, and we talked about St. Thomas and, and his yeah. perennial philosophy. What about this idea of natural law and preferential op option for the poor united in Catholic social teaching 
and then uh, your um, not just yours, but the the manifestos. Uh, what was shall, shall we say? Denunciation of both capitalism and socialism. I'm interested in digging into that. <clears throat> yeah, I bet you are. Uh, and this this is probably the diciest of all the the the, the sort of capitalist socialist thing might be the diciest of all. But let's start with what we mean by Catholic social teaching. What we mean is the mainstream sort of uh, magisterial teaching you know, going way back, not just to Leo the Thirteenth, but even before then. There is a strong body of, of papal work on, on the issue of social justice and the, and the human dignity and the rights of human beings, uh, both political and civil and religious and otherwise. And it's constantly rooted in the church's natural law, moral, theological tradition. All too often in the mo- what we're getting at here is all too often, as you well know, in the modern world, uh, in modern Catholicism, you've got two schools. You've got your social justice warrior Catholics over here who don't really care too much about natural law theorizing because, you know, that's about sex. And, <laughs> and, 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 then, uh, and then you've got the sort of conservatives over here who are all about liturgy and sacraments and doctrine doctrines and sex and 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 you know and the, the morality surrounding that and that's what they use natural law for and never the twain shall meet obviously Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker Movement uh, people can think Dorothy Day was this big this is what really blows my mind so many modern like traditionalists just dismiss Dorothy Day oh she was that Marxist she was that liberal and in many ways she's been appropriated that way by the progressive wing of the church because that's how they prefer to see her but in reality Dorothy Day and Peter Morin who started the Catholic were devout orthodox Catholics that that modern uh, theologians of the progressive wing would consider hopelessly reactionary, which is why some of them have to say, well, if Dorothy Day were alive today, she'd be a liberal, except she'd she lived well past the Second Vatican Council, and, right. and she was not a theological liberal. And precisely for this reason, she grounded social justice in the broader Catholic moral theological tradition. And we see this, uh, a big inspiration for the manifesto is, is, are the writings of John Paul II on, on this matter, because he beautifully, in Evangelium Vitae, Veritati Splendor, and a few other encyclicals, brings all of these things neatly together. And one of Dorothy Day's major points, for, and she bought into the entire for example, of the church's natural law thinking on human sexuality, was that she understood that human sexuality was also a social justice issue. Uh, that unless we get human sexual activities properly oriented, Christologically and properly, that it was going to create a mess that was going to then have a ripple effect in terms of social injustices in our society. Uh, and, and she was a big proponent of the idea that human sexuality was was part of the whole social justice thing. So uh, we, we are looking, I, I, I hesitate to use seamless garment of life ethic because that's been misused and it's been misused for political reasons. So I won't use it. In fact, I'll be critical of, of the many uses to which it's put. But it is a variation of that, if I may say so. It's a consistent life ethic. I mean, the yeah. alternative to a consistent life ethic is an inconsistent life ethic. <laughs> I and like that. You don't that. want to be inconsistent ethically. Yeah, so. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. All right, so, so uh, how does... Uh, I'm going to find the line here because it's a pretty uh, strong line, and, and I... Uh, you, there was no criticism uh, of it from, from my perspective, but, you know, I'm kind of... Uh, too liberal for the conservatives, too conservative for the liberals, and too mod- too extreme for the moderates. So uh, yeah, I, we don't we don't fit into any proper categories. I like so what you, you I like what you said to me the other day on Facebook. You said I'm I'm unmanageable, and <laughs> <laughs> so you said therefore, when new errors and challenges arise in the course of history, rereading the scriptures will always provide us with new theological responses to the fresh snares of Satan in our age of so many evils, capitalism and liberalism, totalitarianism and materialism, the sexual revolution and militarism, we have a great need for new theology. So that's in the section on, under under St. Yeah. Thomas. Uh, you, you, in the third section I mentioned earlier, you also talk about... Uh, these political economic systems. Uh, you say the modern world has witnessed the development of many forms of 
secular materialism, which are all thinly veiled idolatries, <laughs> liberal capitalism, Marxist socialism, and fascist national nationalism have in the last few centuries all taken their turn and persecuting and perverting both the people of God and the poor of the world. So there's a lot there, Larry. Yeah, uh, Sean wrote that, and I, boy, I gave it two thumbs up because I, I said to him, because he wanted to know if he should change any of that. Is it too hard, too harsh? I said, no, you you go, girl, because that, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's good stuff there. Well, so talk a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, the, the, the manifesto sees uh, uh, capitalism, what you call liberal capitalism, and Marxist socialism as... Uh, two opposite sides of the same materialist coin, <laughs> economic yeah. driven understandings of the world and of human beings. Well, you hear, yeah, obviously, we're sh uh, both Sean and I are showing our Catholic worker colors here because this is essentially the social critique offered by Dorothy Day and Peter Morin, uh, as well as people within the personalist movement of that time, Emmanuel Mornier and others. And the distributist movement of that time, I, I think even Chesterton, to an extent, uh, would have bought into uh, to a lot of that analysis. Fulton, Fulton Sheen. Fulton, Fulton Sheen. Would, yeah. Fulton Sheen. Yeah. Uh, you know the Whig Thomists, the, the the sort of conservative Catholics who want to make uh, who make happy face with so, um, some of my chums. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And actually, you know. We, this might be an area where you and I part company, or Carl and I part. I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, but uh, we, uh, the, uh, who wrote the manifesto, uh, uh, take our cues, uh, a lot of them from from Dorothy Day and Peter Moore, and and, and that social critique, and, and 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 even secular economists like Tawney, T A W N E Y, who wrote that book, the, the Acquisitive Society, um, to to point out that okay, obviously. There's free markets, and free markets are a good thing. And there's democracy, and democracy is, is a good thing. We're not monarchists, uh, as some trads are. Um, but, but nevertheless, the way that free market and, and sort of liberal democracy have evolved is that they've evolved in a way that it has a sort of amoral, spiritless core at its center. And its fundamental presuppositions are secular. Its fundamental presuppositions are de facto atheist. They're predicated on the modern socio-political economic principle that God doesn't matter to the construction of society. Okay, and so that might sound like I'm advocating for integralism, and in some sense I am because all governments are integralist, and that's sort of the point here. There's no such thing as a non-confessional government. As Alastair McIntyre said, liberalism is the only meta-narrative that has convinced the world that it's not a meta-narrative, <laughs> <clears throat> that it doesn't have dogmas. That well, it, convince some people in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so um, one of my leading lights and heroes, too, in this regard is David L. Schindler, uh, down at you know, the John Paul II Institute of Washington, you know, the editor of Communio for many, many years. I don't know if he's still the editor, but I think maybe he is. Uh, and... Uh, and I mean, he has written about this for years and years. And of course, he's been critical of John Courtney Murray and 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 he and George Weigel. I love Weigel. He's a great guy. I love George. Uh, but yeah, he, I'd love to get everybody in the room. Together oh yeah, and I mean, have a big conversation about it. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, one of the things I, I'm off topic here, but one of the things I love about George Weigel is that he is capable of changing his mind, and and uh, and he's not doctrinaire. He has a, he has he's a smart guy with a very good perspective on things. I didn't agree with a lot of his more neocon positions, say, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that he has come closer to, to my view, and in some ways I've come closer to his. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the point being is that uh, there's no, there's no, my, I, I'm floundering here to, to explain <laughs> okay. this. There's no magic bullet here. In other words, what right. people constantly want, uh, what's your idea then? Okay, well, how are you going to solve the world's problems? I don't know. You know what? <laughs> I mean, it, it, I mean, read David C. Schindler's, David L. Schindler's son's recent book, uh, The Politics of the Real, which I reviewed in Catholic World Report. Carl yeah. knows that. Yeah. It's an excellent book. And, and it, David C. Schindler critiques liberalism, you know, does not like it. Modern. And by the way, for your listeners, we don't mean liberal as in Joe Biden liberal. I mean, all, <laughs> all American politicians are big L liberals in the sense of the well, dissent. Conser what we call it, call conservatives and liberals or conservatives and progressives fall, fall broadly into that category of liberalism, which premiumizes freedom as, as the highest right. 
uh, good in the political sphere. Yeah, and a certain metaphysical view of freedom right. as a kind of radical autonomy, which we see now. And this is both Schindler's critique of, of what is at the heart of liberalism, as well as people like Michael Hanby uh, and a whole host of others, Patrick Deneen. <laughs> you know. so, so we're going to have to have uh, Robert Riley on, who authored the book America on Trial, where he argues that uh, the American founding is not uh, that sort of unqualified, undifferentiated liberalism but it's it's a huge conversation let me let me robert riley robert i'll just say this the the one interesting thing about the book is that it's wrong (laughs) very good well we should have you and robert riley on no have 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 robert riley on with michael hanby who did a three-part review of his book in new polity that i thought was devastating yeah so did you you, uh this is a little inside baseball but patrick deneen did you see deneen's recent talk where he he basically agrees with Riley on the on the founding insofar as uh, he says the, fa- the the American founding was not uh, this sort of pristine ideologically pure liberal founding that's but, true too that's I think side, side conversation I wanted on the capitalism thing I wanted to get your reaction to John Paul II Santissimus Annas uh, where he says uh, this is in uh, paragraph 42 returning now to the initial question can it perhaps be said that after the failure of communism, capitalism is the victorious social system and that capitalism should be the goal of the countries now making efforts to rebuild their economy and society. Is this the model which ought to be proposed to the countries of the third world, which are searching for the path to true economic and civil progress? This is a question John Paul II is framing. This is, you know, uh, in, after the fall of uh, the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries, uh, John Paul II is saying, does this mean, in effect, that capitalism is one? And he gives this response. He says, the answer is, uh, is obviously complex. If by capitalism, in quotes, is meant an economic system which recognizes the fundamental and positive role of business, the market, private property, and the resulting responsibility for the means of production, as well as free human creativity in the economic sector, then the answer is certainly in the affirmative, even though it would perhaps be more appropriate to speak of a, quote, business economy, quote, market economy, or simply, quote, free economy. But if by capitalism is meant a system in which freedom in the economic sector is not circumscribed within a strong juridical framework, which places it at the service of human freedom in its totality, and which sees it as a particular aspect of that freedom, the core of which is ethical and religious, then the reply is certainly negative. I know I've given you a long uh, quote there from John Paul II, yeah. and I just kind of get your reaction in light of both your experience as a Catholic worker, you know, Catholic worker farm uh, owner, and also in terms of the manifesto. Well, all I can say is, uh, God bless John Paul II, and thank God God gifted him to the church for all those years. Uh, uh, he is continues to be my my ecclesiastical hero of, of my lifetime, and that quote you just gave is a perfect reason for it, uh, because I, I could not agree more with everything that he just said. Uh, it's exactly why Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker Movement also opposed socialism. Um, she viewed... And let's go back to the Robert Riley thing we were talking about sure. before, that there's no pristine sort of single essentialized notion of the American founding. I think that's partly true. And I'm not, I, I, in many ways, I don't care. <laughs> I, I don't care. To me, it's where are we now? Right. What did that eventually evolve into? Whether or not the evolution was inevitable and rooted in metaphysical principles that were out of there or, or some other thing happened right. to derail, I don't care. The fact is, here we are. And where we are now is that second form of capitalism uh, that, that John Paul II uh, criticized. And socialism is just government-controlled capitalism. They're just two, two pieces of it's It's corporatism. It's cronyism. Um, it's 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 all bureaucratized. It's it leads to a depersonalized, anonymous beehive notion of the of the human being as a consumer, a consumer of goods. 
Um, and these things are all very degrading, dehumanizing. And that's why John Paul rightly says this cannot be exported to the third world. This is, this is not the alienating form of consumerist life that, that we need to be. And, and, there, and, and the fact is there is this amoral, spiritless core at the heart of modern capitalism. And that's what John Paul is getting at too here. When you look at some of his other writings, it's it's the sort of eclipse of God, as Ratzinger put it, but John Paul was already all over that. The I eclipse could, I, of... Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I can only imagine... Uh, we should get to say a little bit before we... We're running long here, but before we go, we should say a little bit about Pope Francis in the manifesto. But as I was saying, John yes. Paul II, you know, he did... I mean, obviously, as, a, as an elderly man... Uh, in many ways incapacitated he lived what well he well lived into the 21st century uh, but i don't think he ever saw this uh hyper capitalistic uh, merger of what you see with the internet and um what's going on in in the in the business sector right now and because it's it's so extreme uh people talk about that with respect to uh ideas on the internet and how we all become siloed and we get we live in our own little bubbles. And Susanna get, Zuboff calls it uh, surveillance capitalism. Yeah, that's, what, that's, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. So that uh, we are constantly bombarded, not just with advertisements. You can make criticisms that even in the 1940s and the 50s and 60s, we were overly advertised as a, as a society, but now it's just pushed to the nth degree. So I'd be curious to see what, John Paul would have thought about that in, in, in light of uh, Santissima Sana. I, I think he would have said, see, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Pope Francis, you know, I have, uh, I'm going to be honest. I have really mixed feelings about Pope Francis, um, and that'd be a different show for a different day. Uh, let's just say I have my criticisms to make of him, but let's not do those here. The fact is there are elements of what he has written which are right up the alley of, of the manifesto. Uh, his 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 extrapolation uh, in in some of his encyclicals of some of these ideas of what what a real tradition is the role of faith the role of holiness his ecological concerns which are also our concerns I don't think it, it's anti Catholic. Well, I'm, I'm going to stop you on that later yeah. on the economic on the ecological concerns because I mean I, I really think you're you know you present yourself as being economic eco, ecologically concerned and you present yourself as concerned about older people but i mean I, look a lot of older people have to print out articles on the internet and when they come to gadmitspez22.com and they go to print out your articles whole forests are killed so i just i don't know about this uh, francesca murphy who's a theologian at notre dame and a friend of mine said that my post should be a lot better if i wasn't such a windbag <laughs> But some people like my windbaggery. Uh, I admit I do. Yeah, and, and yeah. Wind, wind power and solar power are both the you know <laughs> where it's at. So. <laughs> oh, that's great. But yeah, I'll give a shout out to Francesca for that, though. All right. Well, Carl. I mean, I've dominated here. You, you. No, no. That, I. You two are big Pope Francis fans, so I'd like to hear you guys talk. Well, about I that. I agree with Larry. That would be a whole discussion. I think. Yeah, I, yeah. I, we could have lot. it, but. The fourth part, too, on the liturgy would be an entire discussion, I think. In fact, that might be something we could think about doing. But yeah. maybe maybe in conclusion, you could just give a, a, I'd love to. a summary of the fourth part on liturgy. Like, what, where are yes. you coming from? What's the, what's the focus, et cetera? The focus is is actually would surprise a lot of people, you know, because I'm so critical of the traditionalists. But I think the one point that traditionalists do have that's a valid point is that the liturgical reform that the council called for is not the re liturgical reform that we got. And Sean and I and Mark Barnes are we're we're all in agreement here. When we're not. We're not going to say the Novus Ordo is invalid and we, everybody needs to run off to the Latin Mass. I'm not a big fan of the old Latin Mass, to be honest with you. Uh, and when I've gone to them, I thought, meh, what's the big deal? Uh, you know, I'm perfect. I go to an Anglican ordinariate parish myself, which is a very sort of sort of dressed up Novus Ordo <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, it's 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 a high flute Novus Ordo in vernacular and everything, ad orientum. But we believe that the, the liturgical reform and renewal, as the liturgical movement in the 20th century saw, was absolutely necessary. Contrary to the propaganda of the modern trads, there were problems in the in the in the ecclesial practice of the old liturgy. Most Catholic 
Catholics went to low mass, not these high solemn masses that the traditionalists love now, that those low masses would last 30 or 35 minutes. There was no chant. The priest mumbling through Latin, he barely understood. People praying their rosaries or walking around doing whatever during the mass. It, 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 and, and, and no less a light than, than Guardini, Balthazar, Bouillet, Ratzinger, Bernanos, and all these people were pointing this out even before the council. So th the reform was needed, and the manifesto says so. Um, but we do believe that there was there was a, a, a something lost with the Novus Ordo, and that we are therefore believers in what has come to be known as the reform of the reform of the liturgy, which we think Pope Benedict uh, wanted to do. I think that's why Benedict instituted Samorum Pontificum, because he wanted a cross-fertilization of the, with, from the old form of the liturgy to, to the Novus Ordo uh, to introduce certain elements that have been lost, maybe things like worship ad orientum, you know, like at my ordinary at parish, we, we receive communion kneeling at a altar rail on the tongue with intinction, um, and a little lots of incense and lots of chant. It's sort of Anglican plain chant, not Gregorian, but it's still beautiful. And uh, you know, the, uh, we just believe that the liturgical reform is ongoing, and that we need we need pastoral leadership. And this is what I will say from about Pope Francis. Instead of traditionis custodes, we needed a synod on liturgy, and we needed accompaniment for those among us, myself included, who think that the liturgy needs a reform. It, it, granted, there were problems in the traditionalist movement that needed to be dealt with. Well, then deal with them. Uh, but I don't think that means we needed to outlaw the, the old form of the liturgy and to sort of simply now set in stone the 1972 version of the Novus Ordo is, that's it. That's it, folks. We're done. Um, so that that's sort of what we're getting at there in the manifesto. Good. Well, as Carl hinted at, there's so much more that can be talked about with respect to this manifesto. And Larry, you are an endless font of information and ideas and perspectives on things. Some so, of it good. <laughs> most of it good. Um <laughs> You know, we, we can't resist the temptation to get you in public right now to commit to coming back and talking to us. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. I, I'd love talking to you guys. Well, very good. Well, Larry Chap, Dr. Larry Chap, theologian extraordinaire, uh, <laughs> the author and publisher of Gaudium at Spes 22.com and also one of the originators of this manifesto of the new traditionalism. Thank you for being with Carl Olson and me. Thank you for having me. It's been great. A lot of fun. Thanks, Larry.